I said no, but I have to tell you, this is a pretty hard act to follow. Right here. So, so maybe I am a little nervous, but one thing that is helping me lower my uh, anxiety is I have an absolutely fantastic gospel to preach on to you this afternoon. And in the gospel, we hear what I think might be the most important question in all of Scripture. Who do you say that I am? And who is my neighbor? And if we think about it for just a moment, I think what makes this question, this gospel, so intriguing is that if we're at all honest with ourselves, our neighbors come in many disguises. And um, ex-Jesuit, unbelievable theologian, um, died recently, uh, Bill Spohn, wrote a great book called, um, thank you, from Berkeley, Go and Do Likewise. <laughs> and in this book, what uh, Bill Spohn is really asking us to do is to engage what he called our analogical imagination to read scripture and then to imagine, what does this mean in our contact, context here on Valparaiso Avenue at Sacred Heart on a beautiful July afternoon? And as we think about this, I looked at something Father Rollheiser did this week as I was preparing for this, and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit. But he said, if we were to think about what does that mean today, if there was actually on our way here or our way home, if there was actually a person who fell into the hands of robbers and was injured and we came across this person, what might happen? Well, Sister Barbara Dawson, close your ears for a minute. If you were a provincial, and let's leave Sacred Heart alone, let's say of the Jesuits, and you were driving along in your Toyota Prius, and you saw um, uh, a person by the side of the road who'd been uh, robbed and beat up and left, uh, to die, you might say, I feel a lot of pity for this guy, but this doesn't exactly fit into our mission statement, and we don't have <laughs> enough Jesuits to do this, and we're involved in education, and would probably keep driving. If you were, close your eyes, John, a theolo the theological student at Berkeley, you might have taken a class from me on pastoral counseling or clinical psychology, and as you saw the robber, you might have said, I remember Father Frank said that we really, in religious life and as ministers, as lay people, we've got to work on healthy boundaries and self-care <laughs> and when to say no. Take care of ourselves and keep driving. <laughs> If you would have been at the Diocese of San Francisco and involved in social justice in some way, you might have seen that robber and said, or sorry, you might have seen that person injured on the side of the road and said, in social justice, we're interested in relationships, but really we're interested in the bigger picture. <laughs> and you might have also driven on. Now I leave Rollheiser for a minute, I let my own imagination go, and I picked a little different person, but I thought, you know, the person who might surprise us, who stopped for that person who was left to die on the side of the road, might have been someone kind of unexpected. It might have been someone driving in her brand new BMW. I'm hoping she might have been in a pretty good mood because maybe her daughter just got into Sacred Heart High School right here. I'm also hoping maybe she was an alumni of Sacred Heart Schools and knew a little of the mission of the Sacred Heart Society. And she might have, to all of our surprise, unlike the provincial and the theological student and the person in charge of the diocese, she might have pulled that new BMW over, she might have put the person in her car, taken them over to Stanford Hospital, given them a platinum credit card, and said, take care of this person. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, and I'm going about it in a roundabout way, is neighbors come in all kinds of disguises, and they're never quite like what we think they're gonna be like. And even though we might do an MDiv at the Franciscan or Jesuit School of Theology, really God continues to surprise us. And as I was thinking about neighbor, and I was thinking about mission, and I was thinking about coming here, I thought, where have I experienced that in my own life recently? 
Well, I'm, uh, I'm a psychologist in the uh, counseling department at USF. But on Fridays, I did a little bargaining, and I get to get off of uh, the hill, and I get to go down to the Tenderloin, and I get to do a 12.30 to 1.30 substance abuse support group for people living on the streets. And it's actually the highlight of my week. Well, two weeks ago, I went there, and I do, it's kind of a little controversial, but I do what's called kind of a harm reduction model. In other words, people aren't necessarily going to stay sober forever, but can you stay sober for a day? Can you do some harm reduction? And one of the things I try to do is what's called evidence-based practice for flourishing. I'm going to suggest you might try it also. But we do a little mindfulness exercise for the first 30 minutes. Then we talk about it. And then we do this really crazy exercise called WWW. Now, all the students at, Uni at University of San Francisco tell me that's World Wide Web. But if you're in the world of positive psychology, it's an acronym for what went well. And when I do this group, what we do, we go around the room, and you've got to leave all negativity at the door. And each person has to say three things that went well that day. And believe it or not, try it with your families, try it with your friends, try it with your communities. It actually works. So as we went around the room, I also tend to be a little negative at times. So I usually appoint a negative police person who, if anyone says negativity, they got to go. So as we do this, um, you're not allowed any negativity. And a friend of mine, she's a pro I'm also a uh, I used to live, I say mass a lot at St. Agnes, so I get a lot of them to join me in my craziness downtown. And uh, Diane Davies is this wonderful retired nurse, and I was like, Diane, could you come help me do the group? And she's like, sure, Father Frank, what do you want me to do? I'm like, just come and see. <laughs> so we sit in the group, and when I tell them every Friday, I was like, for this group, no negativity, only positive things. If anything comes up, and I know there's a lot in your life that's negative, when the group's over, Diane Davies has an office, go and see Diane. And by the end of the group, there's a line out the door, and I go back up to Lone Mountain. <laughs> Two Fridays ago, Diane surprised me, because I asked someone to raise their hand to volunteer. And she raised, so who wants to do what went well? And Diane shoots her hand up. And she's like, Father Frank, I want to do what went well, but I, I don't want the negative police kicking me out. It's going to seem a little negative to you at first, but stay with me. So she said, um, last week, she had, um, her mother had been ill for quite a while. And she and her sister had flown in from Portland. And they got together, they, they took their mom to the doctor, and the doctor you know, gave them the news. Your mom, her time is limited, and it's really time for her to do hospice. So the family got together, they had a meeting, and they put their mom in hospice. And to their surprise, her mother did really well. And every week, Diane would go and visit her in hospice. And Diane could tell it was getting near the end. And she went to visit her mom, and this was for the what went well. She said, the first thing that went well was when I went to see my mom, my mom said, um, Diane should run a couple of the homeless people from the wellness center. So I'm sure her mother thought it was a little odd anyway. But as they came into the hospice, she said, uh, Diane, I want to do something different today. And Diane said, what would you like to do, mother? It's, you know, it's your life. And she said, uh, I want to get out of here. I want to go to the beach. And Diane said, well, mother, I'm not sure with the oxygen tanks and the masks you're going to be able to do all this. And with this, the mom just took off the oxygen and said, Diane, I'm dying anyway. Let's go. <laughs> so Ricky and Jamie and Diane and Diane's mother get in the car. And as they're going to the beach, her mother says, Diane, pull over. I want to stop at my favorite ice cream store and get some ice cream. So they pull over, and they all get ice cream, and they go out to the beach. And they sit on the beach, and Diane said, it was one of the nicest days I ever spent with my mother. And two days later, her mother died. Neighbors come in all kinds of disguises. I don't think Diane would have seen her mother as a neighbor. And yet, by being able to do this thing of relationship, by being able to think outside the box. She was able, with people from the wellness center, to minister to her mother 
in a way she had never been able to do before. Now, I don't think her mother at the time would have thought she would have been ministering to a bunch of homeless people. But the most interesting thing, and I do this group a lot on evidence-based practice of what went well, after Diane told that story of taking her mother to the beach and getting ice cream, something very unusual happened in that homeless shelter. It was, next, it was a turn for the next person to say what went well. And usually for those guys and women, it's sometimes it's a little like pulling teeth. And I'm like, look outside, it's a nice day. You're in San Francisco. Uh, you, we're going to have apple pie afterwards. But this day, they rolled off what went well, like I've never experienced. And I think this is the way relationships work. We're all transformed. And I think this question in scripture that we hear today, who is my neighbor, gets to the very heart of the Christian call to discipleship. And as I was thinking about this, we're going to renew vows today, I went back again to Madeline Sophie. And I started to think about her, I did a 10 minute homily a few months ago at Oakwood, and at the end, Nancy Moore said, well, something about Madeline Sophie, she did three things. She, um, she had a deep inner personal life, she had a network of relationships, and she had spiritual ideals. And I was like, yes, Nancy, that is it. And at the end of the day, she was a woman way ahead of her time. As a psychologist, they're just now finding with trauma research, I read an article last week, that with the neurotransmitters on the frontal lobes, the most severe trauma can be healed in only one way, and that is relationship. We're finding this out in the 21st century. We've got the evidence to back it up. Madeline Sophie was a woman on her own with her faith and just indefatigable energy to know from her own experience that this was true. And as I thought about this, um, I came across um, just an excerpt from a book written by um, Sister Kilroy titled Madeline Sophie, A Life. And I think this idea of who is my neighbor, I did, I looked everywhere I could look, and I don't think anyone gets it more correct than Madeline Sophie. And I think Sister Kilroy catches it just right, and I'd like to share it with you. She says, as a 19th century woman, Sophie Barat found her way out of a private life into a public role with public profiles. And she did this with her colleagues because she had a public service to offer which met a need in the society and in the church. However, another inner narrative was taking place at that same time one that informed the outer and gave the impulse and energy to sustain so much activity. And while she was engaged in the founding and consolidation of the Society of the Sacred Heart, Sophie made an inner spiritual journey in the course of which she continually strove to transform her image of a severe, harsh God into one of warmth and love and vulnerability. Who is my neighbor? Though her exterior success was the focus of her fame in the 19th century and beyond, her inner achievement had greater long-term consequences for the image of the divine, of the holy, in our time. Sophie was endowed with a remarkable capacity for relationship. As we get ready to renew these vows, let us beg for the grace of Madeline Sophie. Let us beg for that grace to recognize our neighbor in those on the periphery, those on the margins, 
the most vulnerable. And if we can recognize our neighbor in the most vulnerable, what happens is our circle does not get smaller. We step out to the margins, we do like Madeline Sophie did with women in the 19th century, and the circle gets bigger and bigger and wider and better. In the spirit of St. Madeline Sophie, let us beg for the grace to recognize the Lord in the most vulnerable. Let the church say amen. Amen.